And in two hours, I went from being a director with a very bright future, who'd finally made it in Hollywood, to a director with no future. What's the unforgettable lesson or the greatest impact that's come out of your journey uh, that you've been experiencing so far? Yeah, I said I came to, back to Chicago to work at this big church and to make movies. And when I got there, I didn't make movies. Um, they weren't ready yet. And I'd moved my entire family back to Chicago. And the first several years, I was asked to help out in production team and, and the video team. And I'd never done any videos before. I finally came to the church leadership and I said, listen, we got to do something. We got to, I, I can't wait anymore to make something. What if we just did a short film, even just for the, for the Christmas Eve service, just to get, keep my filmmaking juices flowing? So we quickly assembled this project and I did a short film. It was called The Ride. And we ended up doing it for our Christmas Eve service. However, I did that short film and still nothing happened until about a year later, that short film got in the hands of one of the biggest producers in Hollywood. And he saw it, long story, I won't get into it, but he somehow saw it and said, I wanna be in business with him, and I actually wanna be in business with your church. And so we started talking, and it was this company that's known primarily for horror films. I mean, they've done films like Get Out and Insidious and Sinister and all these, and they wanted to dip their toes into the faith-based waters. <laughs> yeah. They also had a partner that was also interested in faith-based filmmaking. It was WWE, the wrestling company. <laughs> and so I told them that I worked at this church and I gave them a script that we'd been developing called The Resurrection of Gavin Stone. They loved the script. And so a horror film company, a wrestling company, and a church in Elgin got together and made a movie. And they put up all the money and we got to control all the content. And God was so clearly in this it was extraordinary. We shot it at our church. It has the gospel message clearly. It's funny. It's dramatic. It's got a cool story. And it was done by these great partners. And then Universal Studios got involved and Walden Media got involved. And the plan was to do multiple movies over the next 10 years, faith-based movies that we would control the content. Because I didn't, of course, want to give control of the content to companies that didn't love the Lord. And so they were like, no, no, you control the content. We're all good. Uh, we, we will finance it. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. And then opening weekend came for the resurrection of Gavin Stone. And Friday morning, the numbers came in, and it was a bomb. And in two hours, I went from being a director with a very bright future, who'd finally made it in Hollywood, to a director with no future. Because they had no incentive to keep going, they went back to doing what they did best, horror films and wrestling and, and whatnot. And so I was left with my wife at home at an extreme low point. Not Detroit Lions low, but, but a low point. Thank you for coming. Yes, that was, and that's the end of the story. It was all set up for that. It's the only reason I came. No. But I was at a real low point. I really was. And my wife and I were crying and praying and wondering how we could have gotten to this place. And I remember being so confused and hurt because I was essentially being told thanks, but no thanks anymore. And my wife, God bless her, who I think is even more in tuned than I am many times, God pressed so powerfully on her heart two things. One was the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And the other one was I do impossible math. Now, again, we don't, we're Baptists. We don't hear God's voice, you know, audibly. But it was as if, it was as powerful as if it was audible. And we didn't know what it meant, so we looked into the feeding of the 5,000, and we just knew that that was what God was pressing on our heart. And we've heard that story hundreds of times. But what was so powerful about it this time was we noticed something we hadn't noticed before, and it was that God actually was responsible not only for the miracle, but for the need for the miracle. He knew they were exhausted and tired. In fact, the disciples came to him and said, we need to get these people food. We need to send them home. And Jesus said, oh, they're so hungry. If we send them home, they'll, they'll faint along the way. He knew it. He, in fact, it was his fault. He was the one who'd been talking so long that he'd gotten them that hungry. He got them to the place where the only thing left was a miracle. Then, of course, he could have just magically produced food in all of their laps. He could have just 
waved his hand like I just did, and all of you in this room, just like back then, could have had food sitting in their laps. But he had them go find five loaves and two fishes, or two loaves and five fishes, which is it? You'd think I'd know this, because <laughs> it's so powerful, I promise. Five loaves and two fishes, yes. <laughs> so he, <laughs> sorry. He's a Baptist, he doesn't know everything, you know, I mean. <laughs> Touche. So, five loaves and two fishes, and then when he multiplied it, he had them go and distribute it. He had them do everything that he didn't need them for. Now, combined with the phrase, I do impossible math, we, didn't, we, we thought that perhaps that weekend, the numbers were going to magically turn around, and this miracle was going to happen, and God's glory was going to be shown to these agnostics and atheists out in Hollywood, and they were going to see that this was a miracle. And that didn't happen. It actually got worse. But that night, at 4 o'clock in the morning, I was on my computer, and I was writing a 10-page memo about all that went wrong. I was analyzing what I did wrong. I was analyzing what they did wrong. I was breaking down everything that we should have done differently. And a message popped up on my Facebook feed at 4 in the morning. Didn't say hello. And it wasn't even a friend of mine that I know very well. I'd never actually met him. We were just Facebook friends. We talked maybe once a year. And it said, remember, your job is not to feed the 5,000. It's only to provide the loaves and the fish. <laughs> I remember, sorry, it's, it's, I still get emotional about it, but I remember first thinking, was my computer recording what I was talking about that day? Because <laughs> this was so bizarre. The guy barely even knows me, and I, I texted back. I said, what do you... What? what are you doing up at this hour? And he said, I'm in Romania. I'm on a different time zone. I said, why did you send me that message? And he said, I don't know. God just told me to tell you that. And I can define my life as before that moment and after that moment. Because I knew at that moment, as someone who was in control of a lot of things and who had vision, good vision for a lot of things, it wasn't my job for the results. My job was to get those five loaves and two fish and make them as healthy and good as they can be, and everything after that was up to him. And so at that point, I genuinely, for the first time in my life, was perfectly fine to never make another film. I was perfectly fine if God didn't have for me what I thought I wanted. I was joyful. It's the difference between joy and happiness. Happiness is temporary. Joy happens regardless of circumstance. And I genuinely had that joy that comes that you can't understand unless you have it. And I thought, I'm willing to not do another film. And of course, that may not be my choice, but I'm willing to not do it. And that's why, a couple months later, I poured myself into another short film for my church's Christmas Eve service. And it was about the birth of Christ from the perspective of the shepherds. And so that's what I poured myself into. And again, just this small loaf and fish for my church. And while I was making it, I had this idea for a show. I thought a show about the life of Christ could be interesting. And we can talk about that in a minute, but, but when I made this short film, I finished it, gave it to the church. This was like in, in, at the end of the summer, Stu, because we got it. We, we, we live in Illinois, and you guys know this, as whether you can't shoot too many things uh, out in, uh, in November or December. So we shot it on my friend's farm in Illinois. Behind his barn is where we shot this short film. And so about August or September, it got in the hands of a distribution company, and they came to me, and they said, this is incredible. We really want to be a part of whatever you're doing. Again, short film for my church. They said, and I told them about my idea for a show, and they said, oh, we would love that. We want to be all in. We're all in on this show, and I was really excited. And then they said, we want to raise the money through crowdfunding, and I got really depressed. <laughs> because crowdfunding rarely works. It's usually for very small projects, and the all-time crowdfunding record was 5.7 million for a project that was famous. Like all the, all the projects in the top five crowd funds of all time for media projects are famous uh, shows or movies that had a big fan base. We had nothing and I was coming off of a big bomb. Loaves and fishes, man. It's not my job to feed the 5,000. I was in that loaves and fishes moment and that's why I was open to it. I had nothing to lose and I had everything to gain from the understanding that this isn't up to me. And I'm perfectly okay regardless of what happens. So what? So what? Well, I, I honestly thought, I've said this before, I thought we'd raise $800. And eventually, again, long story short, we ended up raising over $10 million from over 19,000 people around the world, all based on that little short film that I did for my church. And I remember when we were sitting at the computer and the number hit that 10 million mark, which was enough to do a, a full season. 
like a lightning bolt had hit my wife and she looked at me in tears in her eyes and said, I do impossible math. That's what that meant. Because we didn't know what it meant because it sure, certainly didn't add up for a long time. And I can honestly stand before you, though, and say that if it didn't work, I would have that same level of joy because I truly am in that place where it doesn't matter what happens. And now I could come back here next year and say, actually, the first season of The Chosen, which we ended up making, was a huge failure, and I'm sorry, <laughs> and I had to learn another lesson. But it's not that. I really don't care about, the, about what my role in this is other than to make sure. I do, of course, care about what my role in it is, but I'm saying I don't care about what it is outside of the loaves and fish that I provide because everything else is up to him. And that's, that lesson, that you use a great term, unforgettable, that unforgettable moment is why I'm, I'm with you today. Well